Welcome to Doctors on Call. I'm Dr. Alan Johns from the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the University of Minnesota Medical School, Duluth. Tonight we're going to talk about skin problems. What would you like to know about the diagnosis and treatment of skin issues like acne, eczema, skin cancer, or psoriasis? We would be happy to take your questions about those or any other skin problems you might be worrying about. Call the numbers on the bottom of your screen and ask away. Locally, dial 218-788-2844 or call toll free at 1-877-307-8762. Our panelists this evening include Dr. Susan Ash, a dermatologist with Essentia Health Clin Duluth Clinic. Dr. Michael Beyer, a dermatologist with Essentia Health Duluth Clinic. And Dr. Heather Buckholz, a dermatologist with St. Luke's Dermatology Associates. Our medical students answering phones tonight are Stephanie Gilson from St. Paul, Minnesota, Elena Jackson of Grand Rapids, Minnesota, and Robin Souter of Lanesboro, Minnesota. And now on to tonight's program on skin problems. Well, Dr. Ash, this is the time of year when everyone's skin gets dry. I know mm -hmm. I've got a few dry patches. Yeah. What, uh, mm -hmm. what do we do about this? Um, it's actually something I see pretty commonly this type of year. Everyone's skin gets, seems to get really dried out. And one of my tips I like to tell people, is just be careful how much soap you're using on your body because soap can really dry out your skin, especially this time of year. So. When you're in the shower, I try to tell people, maybe just not use too much of it. Maybe the areas where you really only need the soap. And uh, try not to have the water too hot. Don't take those long, hot showers in the wintertime. Then you get out of the shower, you have about three minutes before your skin gets even more dried out from the shower. So what you want to do is lock that moisture in with a good moisturizer. And I like creams, maybe better than lotions in mm -hmm. the wintertime. Uh, ointments are the best, but they tend to be a little greasy. So that's one little trick I tell people. Minimize your soap and use lots of good moisturizers. Are there some soaps better than others? or? Well, there's some that, for people with really dry skin, I like them to use um, like a, a gentle soap cleanser, a non-soap cleanser called Cetaphil. Mm -hmm. So you can get that pretty easily over the counter and it doesn't dry your skin. It's really good for washing your hands too if you have hand dermatitis, which I see a lot of. Sure. So if you wash your hands a lot, maybe pick up some Cetaphil gentle skin cleanser and then make sure you put lots of moisturizer on your hands right after you wash your hands too. Interesting. Well, yeah. thank you. Dr. Dr. Beyer, um, you certainly see lots of people with moles and skin cancers, and how do, how do we determine what's to, what do we worry about when we look at our skin? Sure, people get lots of gross on their skin, and what we ask uh, people to watch for would be lesions that might be changing in size or changing in color. Uh, say they would start to bleed or get a sore that wouldn't, de uh, wouldn't heal. Uh, also moles that would have different colors, uneven pigmentation, uh, an irregular border, those can be warning signs. And a mole that would be uh, changing, uh, say changing in sensation um, uh, or in some other way, uh, that should alert you to maybe come in and get that, that mole checked out. Thank you. Dr. Buckholz, I saw something on TV this evening on the news talking about tanning beds and young uh, girls who are wanting getting into tanning and and uh, is that that's bad right for sure we yep definitely tanning beds and the exposure to ultraviolet radiation increases your risk of skin cancer all three of the main types of skin cancer basal cell squamous cell and melanoma and melanoma would be the most concerning of those skin cancers and um, right now we're trying to push through some legislation to try to um, not allow people under the age of 18 to tan. So we find that very important because oftentimes the consequence of using the tanning beds is not for years, well the negative consequences don't come for years after using it. So we're hoping to help decrease the risk of melanoma in um, young adults and people as they get older also by decreasing the risk of, or the use of tanning beds in young um, children. Well, thank you. Dr. Ash, are there over-the-counter products? I mean, there's, if I go into a drugstore, there's tons of stuff there for the skin. Are, are there some over-the-counter products that are really pretty good that might, you might not even have to go in to see the dermatologist? Well, like if you have, like, say you have a patch of eczema, like we were talking about, right. your skin gets too dried out, and then you get a patch of itchy area on your lower leg, your ankle. Um, what you can do is you can go to the drugstore and look for hydrocortisone. It's mm -hmm. a really mild topical steroid that you can use short-term, maybe for about a week or two, 
and then you can rub that in the area of like irritation, dry skin, or eczema, and that should help um, clear that up a little bit. Um, other things you can find over the counter, like say you have a wart, one thing you can do is you can get something that has salicylic acid in it. Um, like uh, example might be compound W, and you can try that um, on your wart. You can cover it with the tape and see if that would help get the wart to go away first. Um, if you have acne, a lot of teenagers have acne, you can um, buy a benzoyl peroxide over the counter pretty easily. And they come in washes and gels and creams, and that would be probably my recommendation, first line for treating like early acne or mild acne vulgaris. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Beyer, we have a caller from Duluth who wanted to ask you, and actually I wanted to ask you this question too. What's, what is Mohs surgery? What's a Mohs procedure? Oh, okay, sure. Uh, well, Dr. Mohs invented this uh, skin cancer surgery actually at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Uh, and what you do with Mohs surgery uh, is you would take a layer of tissue uh, around the, the, the skin cancer, and the way you bevel cut, uh, you're able to uh, micrographically control uh, all of the uh, edges. And you can follow out the skin cancers whatever direction they're growing, left or right, up or down, deeper. These cancers can sometimes have roots to them, uh, so they can be much bigger than they appear on the skin surface. So the Mohs technique, it offers us the opportunity to get the highest cure rate. Uh, so with basal cell carcinoma, we can usually get 98 to 99% cure rate. And with squamous cell carcinoma, 97 to 98% cure rate much higher than with other techniques. Yet you can serve as much normal skin as possible. So that's uh, very important uh, such on areas on the face, such as uh, the nose, the lips, the ears, the eyelids. Uh, so it's got some great advantages in those so in the old days, they just cut it out, but they, that was kind of a guessing game as to how much to take off? Right, so say you would take out one of these cancers with say a quarter inch uh, margin around the outside of it. Uh, Sometimes you get it, sometimes you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and you might create a much bigger wound than you needed to mm -hmm. uh, without the microscopic control okay. of the margins. Thank you. Dr. Buckholtz, uh, we have a caller here from Virginia wondering what to do about cold sores. Oh, cold sores. Right. Like a, a breva, a brevia, what can we do? Yeah, so cold sores usually are kind of start as red areas. Maybe there's a tingling that comes on before the sore appears, and oftentimes they occur at the borders of the lips, upper or lower. Sometimes they can occur in other places on the face, and usually they come out at the worst time possible when you're under a lot of stress or you have some sort of upcoming event. So they choose the worst times to come out, and sometimes sunlight can actually be a trigger um, to set off a cold sore outbreak. Um, uh, topically treating them might lead to some symptomatic improvement um, but you know if you have problems with recurrent cold sores and you're getting them quite frequently and you get a tingling sensation or some sort of prodrome before it comes on oftentimes probably more effective would be taking an antiviral pill um, at the first sign of cold sore to prevent it and you can get that certainly from your primary doctors or dermatologists also. Thank you. Dr. Asher, caller from Superior would like to no, and this is another winter thing. In the winter, he gets more dandruff. Uh, is there a way to relieve da that? Okay, yeah. Uh, dandruff is a pretty common skin condition, and for some reason, it, I notice it more in the wintertime in people. And uh, what dandruff really is, that people believe, is that uh, there's a little yeast that grows on our skin. It's a normal um, uh, yeast that tends to grow off our skin oils. And what happens is that our skin doesn't really like it when they overgrow. And so that it causes the skin to get kind of more red and flaky, and you get what's called dandruff. And so people think, oh, my scalp is dry, I better not wash it. And what happens is that the scalp gets oilier and oilier, and then the yeast on there goes, mmm, lunchtime, and it gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> so what I tell people is actually you want to wash your hair more, more frequently. You want to use a, actually an anti-dander shampoo, and I usually recommend ones with selenium sulfide in them. Uh, and then you w want to wash your scalp very um, thoroughly and sometimes even uh, twice in a row and more frequently. And that does seem to help uh, with the dandruff or this, we call it seborrheic dermatitis of the scalp. And sometimes you can get it like in your eyebrows or in your ears or behind your ears and so they can use the shampoo too around there to wash. If it's uh, really, really itchy, you could just for a short period of time on your face you use that hydrocortisone I talked about, just maybe around the ears but not long term. Interesting, thank you. Dr. Bayer, a caller from Duluth, would like to know what about those age spots? 
Oh, so the age spots. Don't uh, get old, is that your, yeah. is that your <laughs> yes. for that? Well, it turns out that the age spots are actually due to sun damage uh, to your skin. So it's a pigment change that occurs in response to sun damage. Uh, so you won't really find age spots where the sun doesn't shine on your body. So if you look at people's buttocks, you rarely see any age spots <laughs> there. <laughs> so uh, try to protect your skin from the sun. Uh, if you find the looks of them unsightly and you want to do something about it, there are some topical bleaching creams that we can use. Uh, and there's some even available over the counter that contain hydroquinone. Uh, uh, and uh, that is available in a 2% strength over the counter. There's a prescription strength that uh, contains 4% that might be a little more effective uh, that can lighten them up a little bit. Other ways that we can lighten them uh, would be with intense pulse light therapy. Uh, and we have certain lasers that we can use to treat pigmented lesions to try to lighten them. Interesting. Dr. Buckholz, a patient, a caller from Duluth, a patient has ichthyosis and wondering, is there anything close to a cure for that? Okay, so ichthyosis is just a, a kind of a word that describes dry skin. Um, it can also be a class, of, a class of inherited diseases like ichthyosis vulgaris. And some of the suggestions that Dr. Ash gave are really excellent for um, just trying to keep the skin moisturized. Um, there's quite a few different forms of ichthyosis that are genetically inherited and they range in severity from very mild and probably not necessarily even diagnosed by a physician to very severe and life altering. And then depending on the type of ichthyosis, you can kind of try to tailor treatment towards it. But I think in general for the more mild and common type of ichthyosis called ichthyosis vulgaris, um, you know, minimizing soap exposure is excellent. Using moisturizers frequently is important. Sometimes lotions that contain ammonium lactate can be very helpful for areas where you kind of get a built up dry scaly skin or, or fish-like scales. And that's where the word ichthyosis came from, fish-like, which is ichthyotic. ichthyotic. So um, those are just some suggestions, I guess. Thank you. Dr. Ash, a caller for, uh, wants to know what are skin tags and what causes them? Oh, uh, skin tags are really common. I see them quite a bit and they're like little, Actually, like it sounds, little tags of extra skin that uh, tend to develop often areas of friction. So I see them a lot around the neck or on the arm or in the groin area. They're usually skin colored, sometimes they're brown. Um, and they can be rather annoying. They're basically harmless, but sometimes they can get rubbed to the point where they turn red and they become sore. Uh, so when people come into the office, if they really want them removed, I'll usually uh, uh, remove them either with liquid nitrogen by freezing them off or sometimes I'll even give them a little local anesthetic and I'll just snip them off and it's painless. So. But they don't turn into cancer? They don't turn into cancer. They're just annoying but certainly you can leave them there. Good. Call from Duluth uh, would like to know Dr. Byer or call from Hippie I should say it has rosacea on her face for many years has tried Metro Cream and gel. That doesn't seem to be working. Are there any other things can be done for rosacea? Yes. Uh, rosacea, it, it's a type of uh, inflammatory skin condition. It usually afflicts the face, especially the central portions of the face. Uh, and it's characterized by redness, sometimes dilated blood vessels. And then some people will get an acne component to it where they get little red bumps or pustules, sometimes even nodules and cysts. Uh, so we start out uh, sometimes treating it with topical metronidazole, which is what was in your uh, Metrogel and Metrocream. Uh, if that's not effective, uh, a topical azelaic acid can sometimes uh, be helpful in those patients. Uh, we've also used topical antibiotics. Uh, and if topical therapy uh, doesn't work, uh, then uh, we can use antibiotics by mouth. And we use antibiotics by mouth not only for their antibacterial properties, but some of them have some anti-inflammatory properties also that take some of the redness and the inflammation out of the, sk the skin. Uh, so that, uh, those treatments work well for the uh, pimple-like component, the acne uh, part of the rosacea. Uh, they don't work so well for the redness and dilated blood vessels. Uh, so for the redness and dilated blood vessels, uh, and some of these patients will also have some facial flushing associated with that. Uh, we have laser technology available. And if we would choose a laser that has a green wavelength, that's more selectively absorbed by the red color in the blood vessels. 
and we can use this pulse dye laser, uh, green wavelength, to, to heat up those blood vessels enough to clot them off and lighten up some of that redness. Uh, there's also a, a medication that came on the market uh, this last year uh, that um, blocks a certain pathway that's involved in the flushing. Uh, and we've been trying that on some of our patients now for the facial flushing and the redness. Thank you. Dr. Buckholz, a caller from Duluth, would like to know what's the difference between squamous and basal cell cancer? Is, is one worse than the other? Or? Um, well, they, there's, they're originating from different cell layers within the epidermis, and the epidermis is the top portion of the skin, and the dermis is the deeper portion, and so squamous cells and basal cells are originating from different cell layers. Um, basal cells, the most common type of skin cancer, and it's also kind of the best behaved. If you had to have a skin cancer, I would choose a basal cell carcinoma because typically it, it can be just excised and the cure rate is very, very high. Squamous cell skin cancers, um, have a little bit of a risk of being able to spread into lymph nodes and so we have to treat those a little bit more aggressively particularly in patients who might have compromised immune systems such as an organ transplant patient um, so there, there are different types of skin cancers that come out of different cells and have slightly different type of behavior um, but both of them are much more um, treatable and have a better prognosis than melanoma particularly if melanoma is caught at a later stage. Dr. Ash, a caller from Duluth Skin there's skin cancer in the family. Uh, should she be concerned about her sons or daughters getting the check? I mean, do skin yeah. cancer runs in families? It, it can, and it depends on the type of skin cancer. Um, definitely um, people with melanoma, malignant melanoma, there's a um, chance it could be inherited. And so if there's someone in the family has melanoma and there's a, perhaps another one, a first real relative with a melanoma or even pancreatic cancer, um, there might be an increased risk for inheriting that um, in other generations, so that's a little bit of a concern. Um, but I have seen, it seems like sometimes um, basal cells and squamous cells might run in families, but that might be because that family has very fair skin type and maybe they out, um, were outdoors quite a bit, they vacationed outside, and so it was not directly inherited, but um, sometimes it does tend to run in families basically because of their skin type. Dr. Byer, a caller has psoriasis. It looks like psoriasis. This is the first caller with that. From, she's from Carlton. He's from Car Carlton. Uh, what can is there something over the counter you can use for psoriasis? It, these were itchy patches on his knees. Sure, uh, psoriasis is an inflammatory skin disease, and it's usually characterized by fairly well demarcated red scaling plaques on various parts of the skin. Uh, and some of the things that are available over the counter would be the topical cortisone cream that Dr. Ash uh, mentioned, like a 1% hydrocortisone cream. Uh, topical tars can sometimes be beneficial. Uh, so uh, if you would apply uh, some of those medications like twice a day and maybe alternate one week using the topical tar, the next week using the topical cortisone, uh, that could help to keep the, the condition in check. Uh, we also find that just using moisturizing cream sometimes helps keep some of the scaling down. Uh, some people get psoriasis in the scalp, and there are some uh, uh, dandruff shampoos available. Uh, those that contain zinc pyrethrone, uh, head and shoulders would probably be an easy one to find in that uh, category. Uh, selenium sulfide, so selsun blue would be one in that category, and uh, topical tars in the shampoos like tea gel. Uh, so you could wash your scalp with those to keep the psoriasis in check in the scalp. Thank you. Dr. Buckholz, we have a caller from Duluth uh, who itches all over. Help, he uh -oh. says. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so is, it more, than, is it more than just dry skin, I guess, is the first question. I would first take Dr. Ash's gentle skin care recommendations. Okay. And then I, th I think the other thing to think about is uh, itching by itself without the presence of rash makes us think about different causes than itching when the rash is present. Um, sometimes scratching itself can cause a rash so the lines can kind of blur but um, you know oftentimes skin especially in winter can be itchy just because it's dry and kind of irritated or the soap's too strong or that type of thing but um, if there's really itchy skin but no sign of rash on the skin and if the itching's all over the body we'll oftentimes work with um, patients primary care doctors also to make sure that it's not an underlying cause for the itching such as some liver dysfunction or kidney um, 
dysfunction because that can increase the risk of itching. Mm. And then, you know, there's also the chance of little critters like bed bugs that could cause itching, but then you should be seeing little red bumps typically uh, at those sites. So I guess the first question would be which category, if you have right. itching with rash or just the itching no. by itself, and then, it'll, then you'll approach it differently. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ash, uh, Dr. Buckholz just uh, briefly touched on this subject, but there are internal problems that can occur that can cause rash too. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Not all rash is just limited to the skin. There may be some other problem associated with it mm -hmm. that's causing it. Oh, yeah, like Dr. Buckholz said, I mean, occasionally um, there might be like, some uh, kidney dysfunction or, or liver dysfunction. Um, uh, rarely, very rarely it could be a malignancy. So I usually do, I do some blood work. Um, and refer back to the primary care physician, take a really detailed history. Sometimes people are on medications, and so I look at their med list, I'm like, oh, it looks like you might have started this recently, and they sometimes, usually have a rash, but not always. Um, so I look for that. I'll, I'll look, um, first thing, I, you know, I'll look at their palms too to make sure they don't have scabies, which uh, they don't see too much of, but sometimes that can cause very intense itching. You can see little burrows on the palms. So that's not really an internal problem, but that's something that can cause kind of generalized itch all over. Sure. Yeah. Sure. We just have a few minutes left here. Dr. Byer, uh, Dr. Byer uh, caller from Duluth, does sunscreen really prevent skin cancer? Uh, yes, we believe it can, uh, but it shouldn't be your sole means of protection from the sun. Uh, so what we recommend would be a sunscreen with a sun protection factor 30 or higher. Um, in uh, studies, uh, they usually apply the sunscreen fairly thick, uh, and what we find is the general population uh, doesn't put it on as uh, thickly as they should. Uh, and some of these sunscreens will wash off, so if you're swimming or, or you're perspiring, you might need to reapply them. And then we also want people to wear protective clothing, like a broad-brimmed hat in the, their head, shirt in their back, longer sleeves to keep the sun off. And you also want to watch out for the midday sun when the ultraviolet rays are most intense. Uh, so in the winter months, it would be at 12 noon. Uh, in the summer, we set the clocks at a d to daylight savings time, so everything's advanced forward an hour. So 1 o'clock is the peak sun intensity in the summer. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Buckholz, does stress play a role in eczema and psoriasis? For sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Stress can certainly aggravate both of those conditions and numerous other skin conditions. Um, and oftentimes, yeah, so management of the stressful situation and life stress seems to help um, with management of the skin disease also, yeah. Thank you. Dr. Ash, uh, could, we have a caller. C could you spell the name of the soap you were talking about oh, a little I'm earlier? Sorry. Yeah, um, I pronounce it Cetaphil, or some people say Cetaphil. It's C-E-T-A-P-H-I-L. And it's a Cetaphil Gentle Skin Cleanser. It's one of my favorites. Thank you. Let's see. There's, um, a caller has, a doctor buyer caller has some, some wart-like flaky areas on their scalp. I know that's not a real great de uh, description, but um, what possibilities? Um, my guess would be that perhaps they have something called a seborrheic keratosis, okay. which is kind of like a barnacle that grows on your skin. And they can be somewhat wart-like. Mm -hmm. And we can see those in the scalp. We see them a lot on the, the trunk and the extremities. And people tend to grow more of them as they grow older. Uh, those generally uh, would need to be either frozen or, or surgically removed. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Buckholz, uh, caller wants to know for neurofibromatosis, that's a skin problem certainly, and other problems. Sure, there's a couple of different types of neurofibromatosis, so it's a pretty complex question. Sure. Um, the most common types of neurofibromatosis, one, which shows numerous little skin growths, but also can be coupled with some internal problems, including eye problems and also some um, hamartomas or benign growths in the brain. But um, certainly that's a genetic um, linked case or situation in, in the majority of cases um, and we usually need a whole team approach with dermatologists, neurologists, ophthalmologists to follow patients with neurofibromatosis. There's some skin findings we'll sometimes see in young children that can kind of clue us to the diagnosis and over time different um, uh, disease findings will present in patients who have neurofibromatosis. So that's a pretty complex problem. It's a pretty complex see, yeah, <laughs> see several, you know, yeah. several doctors for that. 
Mm -hmm. And finally, a quick question. Uh, we've got a minute left here. Uh, Dr. Ash, what are the little red blood spots? You know, everybody has oh. little red yeah. spots on your yeah. stomach and back. Oh, those are so common. They're called cherry angiomas. And they're uh -huh. just little benign gross, little tufts of little blood vessels, little capillaries that kind of grow. And we all get mm -hmm. them as we get older. They come with time and they, they're, they're harmless. They don't mean anything. Nothing so, to worry about. Nothing to worry about. Oh, great. Yeah. Well, thank you. I want to thank our panelists tonight, Dr. Susan Ash, Dr. Michael Beyer, and Dr. Heather Buckholtz, and our medical students, Stephanie Gilson, Elena Jackson, and Robin Sauter. Please join Dr. Ruth Westra next week for a program on lung problems, when our panelists will be Dr. Wayne Elmer, Dr. Timothy Rich, and Dr. Eric Sather. Thank you for watching, and good night. <laughs>